Welcome to Julia for Talented Amateurs, where I make wholesome Julia tutorials for talented amateurs everywhere. I am your host, the Dabbling Doggo. I dabble. Last week, we got a quick lesson on how to use the HTTP package and the DataFrames meta package, but we spent most of our time learning how to use the Gadfly plotting package. Today, we're going to learn how to use another so-called Grammar of Graphics plotting package called Vega Lite. Instead of going through the entire charting catalog, we're going to focus on our geographic display maps to see how maps can help us visualize our data. This should be very interesting. Let's set up our programming environment now so we can get started right away. Open VS Code and maximize the terminal panel. Start the REBEL by holding down the ALT key and then hitting J and O. Make a new directory called tutorial 02 by 09 by using the make directory function. Change your present working directory to your new directory by using the change directory function. Enter the package REPL by hitting the close bracket. Activate your new directory by typing in activate space period and then hit enter. Add the following packages and versions. Type in status to confirm that all of the correct packages and versions have been added. Exit the package REPL by hitting backspace. Minimize the REPL. Create a new file by going to File, New File. Save the file as tutorial 02 by 09.jl by going to File, Save As. Be sure to save your file in your new directory. I'm going to add a header to my file, but there's no need for you to type this in. You can access the source code for this tutorial in my GitHub repository. The link is in the description below. I was a little hesitant to make this tutorial for several reasons. One, I don't think this is a beginner level subject. Two, it's not really a Julia tutorial. And three, I don't fully understand it myself. Although I've learned a lot by putting this tutorial together, I'm kind of dreading the questions that will come up since I probably won't be able to answer them. In any event, I think that being able to visualize your data on a map is an important tool to add to your analytic toolkit. So I've decided to make this video anyways. If you want to skip this tutorial, I totally understand. Skipping this one will not have any impact on future tutorials. If you do decide to keep watching, just know that this is a huge subject and I will only be providing a glimpse into its potential. Have fun. The plotting package that we will be using today is called Vega Lite. The source code for this package is written in JavaScript and not in Julia. Vega Lite runs on the same plotting engine as Data Voyager, which we saw in the very first tutorial of this series. Both Data Voyager and Vega Lite trace their origin to the D3 project and the Vega plotting package. According to their website, D3 stands for Data Driven Documents, and D3.js is a JavaScript library for manipulating documents based on data. It's designed specifically for use with HTML, SVG, and CSS. CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets, which is a common style sheet language used along with HTML and JavaScript to display web pages on the internet. The D3 project traces its roots to Stanford University back to the late 2000s slash early 2010s. Mike Bostock, Jeff Heer and Vadim Ogivetsky were all working in the Stanford Visualization Group and initially created Protoviz, which is a JavaScript library for generating SVG graphics from data. In 2011, they stopped work on Protoviz and started working on D3.js to provide a more expressive framework while also focusing on web standards and improved performance. Mike Bostock led the original D3 team and was a PhD student at the time. In 2013, Jeff Heer moved to the University of Washington to create the University of Washington Interactive Data Lab located in Seattle, Washington, 
which is where D3.js is currently being maintained. Out of the D3 project came the Vega project, which aimed to take the essence of the D3 framework and make it more accessible by providing a language to create custom visualizations of data. So D3 led to Vega, which led to both Vega Lite and to Voyager 2, which we know as Data Voyager. All of their code is licensed using the BSD license, which stands for Berkeley Software Distribution, and commercial use is allowed. D3 is a low-level language for data visualization, so it's difficult to use and is intended for experienced developers who want to create novel visualizations. Vega, which is built on D3, is meant to be a low-level plotting package that is intentionally verbose, but gives a great deal of freedom to create custom plots. Voyager 2 slash Data Voyager requires little to no coding experience, so it's easy to use, but difficult to customize. Vega Lite sits somewhere in between. Of all of the plotting packages that we've looked at so far in this tutorial series, Vega Lite is the most different. Not in a good way or a bad way, just different. The VegaLite.jl package is based on the JavaScript source code for Vega Lite and is being maintained by David Antov, who is one of the champions of the Julia data community. In addition to maintaining VegaLite.jl, he also maintains DataVoyager.jl. He's also the creator of the Julia extension for VS Code. Credit for the development of the original VegaLite goes to the alumni and members of the University of Washington Interactive Data Lab, including Kanit Wangsu Fasawat, now at Apple, Dominic Moritz, also now at Apple, Arvin Satyanarayan, now at MIT, and Jeff Heer, who is still at the University of Washington Interactive Data Lab. When it comes to the plotting catalog of Vega Lite, you can find most of their plotting types and other plotting packages that we've already seen that are written in Julia. But none of the Julia plotting packages have the geographic mapping display capabilities of Vega Lite. The syntax for VegaLite.jl is like a hybrid of JavaScript and Julia. While the documentation for VegaLite.jl for Julia is quite extensive, I actually found the website for the original JavaScript VegaLite to be extremely helpful, despite the fact that all of their code is in JavaScript, which I don't know. I provided a link to their website in the description below in case you're interested in checking it out. Okay, enough with the history lesson. On with the show. Let's start by creating a map of the United States showing all 50 states. The Geographic Information System, or GIS, is a conceptual framework that provides the ability to capture and analyze spatial and geographic data. When using GIS data, 10M represents the resolution of that data. Conceptually, 10M means that one millimeter on a digital map is the equivalent of 10 meters in the physical world. This may be counterintuitive, but the higher the number, the lower the resolution. Let's take a look at what this raw data looks like on a GitHub page for vegadatasets.jl. This is a JSON file containing the geographic data for the United States. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It's basically a text file that contains structured data. It's meant to be easy to read by humans, but as you can see, this file is extremely difficult to comprehend. Fortunately, Vega Lite knows how to translate this file. So let's see how to create a map using this data.
Before hitting Shift Enter, let's take a look at this code. The atvlplot macro is what allows us to use the JavaScript source code in Julia. The projection type is listed as Albers USA. This is the method that is used to project a spherical surface onto a flat surface. There are several different projection types that are available in Vega Lite. A complete list can be found at the documentation for the original JavaScript Vega Lite. The data section is telling Vega Lite where to grab the geospatial data, and the mark section is telling Vega Lite how to display it. Setting the data format type to TopoJSON tells Vega Lite to convert the data to a GeoJSON feature collection. As the name implies, the GeoJSON file format is a format for encoding geographic data structures. Converting to the GeoJSON file format allows Vega Lite to extract feature data like individual states. The GeoShape mark is what Vega Lite calls the plotting type for maps. We're using GeoShape here as opposed to bar or point or some other plotting type. Let's run the code to see what this looks like. Nice, right? It shows all 50 states, although I'm guessing Alaska and Hawaii are not to scale. One thing to note, the Vega Lite plots do not auto-fit inside the plotting panel in VS Code. You can adjust the width and the height settings to suit your needs. Now that we know how to create a plot, let's see how to save it to disk. This saves the plot as an SVG file. The process to save a plot is similar to other plotting packages that we've seen before. Now, what if we want a map of just a single state? How do we do that? The data that we downloaded identifies the state by using the two-digit FIPS codes. Using the list of FIPS codes from Wikipedia, let's take a look at two of the largest states, Texas and Alaska. When using Vega Lite, you can build plots using different layers, and then combining the layers into a single plot at the end. Before hitting Shift Enter, let's take a look at this code. As you can see, this does not look like standard Julia code. The liberal use of the curly braces is an indication that we have left our Julia bubble and wandered into JavaScript territory. But it's not JavaScript. It's more like a JavaScript slash Julia hybrid syntax, so it might take some getting used to. The data and the mark are the same as before but the transform filter section is new. This is Vega Lite's way of filtering the data source to include only the geodata for Texas. 48 is the FIPS code for Texas. Now that we have our layers, we can combine them into a single plot by using the plus operator. Yep, that looks like Texas you can easily modify the code to get a map of Alaska or any other state. In the title, change Texas to Alaska. In the filter, change 48 to 2, since 2 is the FIPS code for Alaska. Then select all of the code from Canvas to Combine, and then hit Shift-Enter. That definitely looks like Alaska. Notice the high resolution. It shows all of those little islands. Let's save this plot. OK, now that we know how to make a map of the US and a map of individual states, 
let's take a look at layering our map with some data. This next example comes directly from Julia's Vega Light documentation. We're going to take our map of the US and then add a layer showing the state capital locations along with the state capital names. Start by loading in some state capital data. Let's take a look at this data using VS Code Display. This data looks like it's in the form of a table. Now, let's take a look at the raw data in the GitHub page of vegadatasets.jl. The source file is actually in a JSON file format, but this file is a lot easier to read than the other JSON file that contained the geodata. The state capital file contains the latitude and longitude information for all of the U.S. state capitals, along with the state name and its capital city name. There are several different ways to describe any point on Earth. One convention is to use latitude and longitude, which are floating point numbers, normally shown in square brackets, separated by a comma. The latitude is the number of angular degrees that the location is either above or below the equator. Positive numbers indicate that the location is north of the equator, and negative numbers indicate that the location is south of the equator. The longitude measures the east-west location. For historic reasons, the zero longitude goes through the Royal Observatory located in Greenwich, England. Positive numbers indicate that the location is east of Greenwich, England, and negative numbers indicate that the location is west of Greenwich, England. The zero longitude is also called the prime meridian. Since the United States is in the Northern Hemisphere and is west of Greenwich, England, all U.S. locations have a positive latitude and a negative longitude. When it comes to plotting on a conventional Cartesian coordinate system, latitude and longitude are actually backwards. Since the latitude is plotted along the y-axis and the longitude is plotted along the x-axis. You'll see in a moment that Vega Light avoids this confusion by simply calling for latitude and longitude rather than dealing with x and y coordinates. So far, this is exactly the same as generating a map of the U.S. This code plots a circle at each latitude and longitude position from the U.S. State Capitals dataset. The Q at the end of the latitude and longitude tells Vega Light that this data is quantitative. In Vega Light, the supported data types are quantitative, temporal, ordinal, nominal, and geojson. In this tutorial, we will only be using Q for quantitative and N for nominal. This code plots the state capital city name at the latitude and longitude positions. In order to avoid printing directly on the circles, the text is offset by the dy attribute. A positive 8 will print the name 8 pixels below the circle, using a negative 8 would print the names 8 pixels above the circle. Just like before, you can combine multiple layers into a single plot. Easy, right? Let's save this plot. Now that we have a feel for the state level detail, let's get a little more granular. Let's create a map of the US showing all of the counties. 
copy and paste the code for the first plot, which was the US map by state, and make some slight modifications by replacing state with county. This is the exact same code, but rather than calling for the states feature, we're calling for the counties feature. Let's save this plot. This next example comes directly from the Julia Vega Light documentation. We're going to create a choropleth map of the US unemployment rate by county. I'm sure you've seen these before, but never knew they were called choropleth maps. They're used a lot during the election season, but they are useful for more than just political maps. Let's start by loading some data to use on our choropleth map. Let's take a look at this data using VS Code Display. This is a file with only two columns with the headers ID and rate. It is unclear what year this data is from or where it came from. I am assuming that the rate column is the unemployment rate. But what is the ID column? It can't be zip codes since there aren't enough of them so it must be a county ID code. I looked around the internet, and the county codes that it seems to match up with are the FIPS county codes. According to this Wikipedia article, the US Department of Commerce stopped using the FIPS county codes back in 2008. If these are FIPS county codes in the data set, I wonder how old this data is. And if we're going to use outdated county codes to match up to a map of the US, I wonder how old this geodata is for the US map that we're using. In any event, let's put a pin in this for now and move forward. So far, there's nothing unusual about this code. Before hitting Shift Enter, let's take a look at this code. We added a lookup transform to this code. A lookup transform tells Vega Lite to find a matching object in the secondary data source. In this case, for every county ID in the primary data source, Vega Lite is looking for the unemployment rate associated with that county ID. We also changed the color syntax by replacing the light gray fill. This new syntax tells VegaLite to automatically fill each county with a different shade based on the unemployment rate. The higher the number, the higher the intensity. So this is an interesting map, but this is also where my challenges begin. All of the examples provided in the documentation are curated to work with Vega Lite. But when I try to generate my own plots using my own data, I've had mixed success. I have had some success generating world maps using our data from the previous tutorials. So I'll share those maps with you next. But before I do, let's save this plot. Okay, let's move on to global data. Let's start by loading in the JSON file containing a map of the world. As a reminder, the 110M means that one millimeter on the digital map 
is the equivalent of 110 meters in the physical world, meaning that this data will generate a map that is roughly 10 times lower in resolution than our map of the U.S. Here, we're changing the projection type to equal Earth. This code is essentially the same as the code for the map of the US. Rather than setting the feature to states or counties, we set the feature to countries. Easy, right? I have the same questions as before. It's unclear to me how old this geodata is, or where it came from, but the map does look nice. In any event, let's go ahead and save this plot. Just like we were able to isolate a single state in the US map, we can isolate a single country in the world map. The geodata uses the ISO 3166-1 numeric code to identify the countries. Note that I've selected a different projection type here. This code is essentially the same as the code that we use to isolate a single state, but we're using a country code instead of a state code. This map looks awful. My apologies if you're watching this video from Italy. Look at what this low resolution did to your beautiful country. This gives you an idea of what a 110M resolution looks like. It's clearly meant for a global map and not suitable for individual country maps. Let's change the country code to get a map of a large country to see if it makes a difference. In the title, change map of Italy to map of Brazil. In the filter, change 380 to 76. Select all of the code from canvas to combine, and then hit shift enter. I'm not sure if this is any better. Brazil is hardly recognizable on this map. Anyways, let's save this plot. Now that we have some experience with world maps, I thought it would be a good test to see if we can create some choropleth maps using the global data that we created over the past few tutorials. In order to match our tutorial data with the world map geodata, we need to add a column for the country code to our tutorial data. In the interest of time, I have gone ahead and done this for you. You can copy and paste this data from my GitHub repository. Go to github.com and search for julia 4 ta slash tutorials. Click on the link to go to my repository. Click on the Series 02 folder. Click on the Files folder. Click on the df underscore countrycode.csv file. Click on the Raw button. Use Ctrl A to select all of the text. Use Ctrl C to copy all of the text. Go back to VS Code. Open a new file by going to File, New File. Click on the new file. Use Ctrl V to paste the code. Save the file as df underscore countrycode.csv.
Be sure that you save the file in the Tutorial 02x09 folder. Now, let's create a data frame using this data. As you can see, I created a smaller file with the country code and the country name, along with the calculations for the 2019 population, the 2019 GDP per capita, and the 2019 population growth rate. We will be using this data to create our choropleth maps. For these choropleth maps, I changed the projection type to orthographic, which will make the plot look like a 3D globe. This projection type allows you to rotate the map in three dimensions. At 000, you will be looking directly at the prime meridian that passes through Greenwich, England. Feel free to play with these settings until you find a rotation that you like. Changing the first number will rotate the prime meridian either west or east. A positive number rotates the prime meridian east, so from your viewpoint, England is replaced by the Americas. A negative number rotates the prime meridian west, so from your viewpoint, England is replaced by Asia. Changing the second number will rotate the equator either north or south. A positive number rotates the equator north, so from your viewpoint, England will move up and you'll be able to see the south pole. A negative number rotates the equator south, so from your viewpoint, England will move down and you'll be able to see the north pole. Changing the third number will roll the Earth's axis that goes through the North Pole and the South Pole. A positive number rolls the axis counterclockwise, or anticlockwise, depending on which country you live in. A negative number rolls the axis clockwise. Before hitting Shift Enter, let's take a look at this code. It's essentially the same code that we used earlier in this tutorial. I just changed the lookup transform to look up the 2019 population data from the country code data frame. Let's combine this plot and see what it looks like. So, the 3D globe is nice, but this view is not that interesting. It shows that the US and Brazil have large populations in the Americas, but that's nothing surprising. Let's change the rotation from west to east to see what that looks like. Now that's a striking view. Everybody knows that China and India have the highest populations. But to see it depicted like this is almost shocking. No other country on Earth comes anywhere close to those countries when it comes to population. Let's save this plot. OK, let's create another global choropleth map, this time showing the 2019 GDP per capita by country. Let's copy and paste the code from above and make some slight modifications.
No real surprises here. Africa and Asia show low GDP per capita, while the higher GDP capita countries are primarily in Western Europe, the Middle East, Far East Asia, and Australia. Let's change the rotation from east to west to see what the other side of the globe looks like. It's not surprising that the US, Canada, and Western Europe are all showing high GDP per capita. But what's going on with that green shading in South America? That location is French Guiana, which I do not have in my dataset. Although French Guiana has its own country code, it is a French territory, so technically it's part of France. It looks like Vega Light has assigned the GDP per capita of France to French Guiana. While this may be technically correct, it certainly is misleading. Although it's misleading, it's fair to say that none of the other plots that we have looked at could have revealed this anomaly. While these choropleth maps may be useful, it's important to apply some critical thinking when viewing these maps. Let's go ahead and save this plot. Our final plot is the choropleth map of the 2019 population growth rate by country. Let's copy and paste the previous code from above and make some slight modifications. It looks like a lot of population growth is happening in Africa. Let's change the rotation from west to east and take a look at the other side. Definitely a more interesting view. Look how fast the countries in Africa are growing compared with the rest of the world. Let's go ahead and save this plot. Also, hit Control S to save your .jl file. That concludes all of the Vega Light mapping examples for today. Let's take a moment to reflect on what we just saw. I personally have mixed feelings about what we just saw. While I do think that these maps are fun to view, it's unclear to me how valuable they are as an analytic tool. As a communication tool, they are a great way to share data with the general audience who may not even realize that they are looking at data. But for those of you that are in the hard sciences, these maps may be too vague to offer any real insights. As for me, I don't think I understand these maps well enough to use as an analytic tool. For now, I will be using these maps as a graphic design tool since using Vega Lite is an easy way to generate vector maps on demand. But I am still interested in pursuing the subject further. I think that my next step is to get a better understanding of the source data to see how geodata is actually created and to learn how to read the raw data. Ideally, I would like to be able to load this geodata directly into Julia so I don't need to go through Vega Lite. I feel like I've learned a lot by putting this tutorial together, but I also feel like there's so much more to learn. What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments below. Is this something that you might use? Or is this just a fun little diversion? Congratulations if you made it this far. Today, we learned how to create maps using the Vega Lite plotting package. We made maps of the US and we made maps of the world. We learned how to layer our maps with useful information and how to generate some pretty cool visuals. If you enjoyed this video and you feel like you learned something new, please give it a thumbs up. For more wholesome Julia tutorials, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell. New tutorials are posted on Sundays slash Mondays. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. Please feel free to share these videos since these tutorials are getting rave reviews. Just listen to what the professional reviewers are saying.